now. Uh, you see so many of the Hillary Clinton staffers. They're hugging each other. Some of them are crying. You see John Podesta in the middle of your screen right there, the campaign chairman. Uh, and you see so many of the others. Uh, this is a very, very sad moment. They're applauding. Hillary Clinton is about to walk into that ballroom and deliver her speech together with her vice presidential running mate, Tim Kaine. This is certainly not what they anticipated. This, they were not getting ready for this. They were getting for a huge victory celebration last night at the Javits Center in New York City. They even had ordered fireworks uh, to, to, to boom out and, and for that glass ceiling which is part of the Javits Center, to be cracked. Uh, Hillary Clinton wanted to become the first uh, female president of the United States, but that is not happening. Uh, she has been defeated. Donald J. Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. He will be the commander in chief. In fact, we just got a statement from Ash Carter, the secretary of defense, saying that he and everyone at the Department of Defense uh, is com are committed to overseeing, in his words, the orderly transition to the next commander in chief. That would be Donald Trump. And starting today, he is getting the same daily intelligence, national security intelligence briefings as the president of the United States. A very sad scene over there at the New Yorker Hotel. Uh, they're getting ready for Hillary Clinton. Gloria, as we await uh, the Democratic nominee, uh, this is going to be a difficult speech for her to get through. I think it is. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And I think a lot of people who have been with her for decades are going to think this is the second uh, of these kinds of speeches that she has had to give. And um, if you look at John Podesta's face there, you could sort of, it sort of says it all. Uh, what happens in campaigns is that people become family when they work for you. And people who have been around Hillary Clinton uh, for a long time uh, feel that today. And I'm sure that, uh, that this is uh, the most difficult speech uh, she's ever given in her life. And, uh, you know, this is somebody, and it's harder, Wolf, in talking to people who have lost. It's harder when you think you're going to win. Walter Mondale said to me, it wasn't as difficult for me because I kind of knew I was going to lose in advance. Uh, Hillary Clinton had just the opposite. I mean, that happened to Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney thought he was going to win, and that was so difficult uh, for him. And so when it flips like a light switch, uh, that is an adjustment. Uh, they, they just brought, I'm sure, the text of her speech, so she'll have it on the lectern there in addition to the teleprompter. Uh, it's it's going to be a moment uh, for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, I, I've seen her get sentimental at times. I've seen her choke up. I've seen her cry. I don't know if that's going to happen this time. Uh, I don't know how much rehearsal she has been able to do. She's going to try to be strong, Dana, but uh, you know how, how very, very upset she and her staff is, and precisely because they worked so hard I mean, on her behalf. I mean, look at Congressman Joe Crowley there, who's been a, he's a congressman from New York, a longtime friend and supporter. Like you said, John Podesta's face says it all. I mean, just that snapshot. Uh, and that's somebody who just believed in her uh, and has for, for a long time. And, and to your point, Gloria, and you learned this in doing that amazing documentary about the losers, um, it is about those people in the front row, Robbie Mook, the campaign manager, Jake Sullivan, uh, who has been closest to her that she clearly will feel most um, bad about because she let them down. But because of the potential historic nature of this, it's all the little girls out there that she promised that she would show a woman president to, and the little boys mm -hmm. yeah. who she would show that the, uh, after the you know the 45th president could actually be a female. David Gergen, I, I I agree with that. I think it's going to be a very very sad moment for her, but I think it's also important to remember with Hillary, she has a religious faith to fall back on. It's been very very stabilizing for her when she takes these blows. She's one of the most resilient people you can imagine. She'll be very sad, but. In, inside that faith makes a big difference for her. Yeah, Maeve, uh, you've covered uh, Hillary Clinton for a long time as well, and, and you know how painful this is for her at, because you know how hard that staff for two years how hard they have worked day and night. You see all those faces in the front row there, Robbie Mook. Uh, you saw Podesta. You saw Jake Sullivan. Uh, you saw uh, so many of those. Jennifer Palmieri. They really work nonstop and it's so sad, I'm sure, for her that she feels she's let them down. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's just, it's just, it's so long coming to this moment. I mean, to have to do this again is just a remarkable uh, thing that she's going to have to do. And I, I do think that so many people last night, because the Clinton campaign was so bullish about her chances, was expecting it to be this this huge historic moment. Uh, you know, that would be that would would go down in history, and to pivot so quickly to. A Donald Trump presidency. There's just so many people that are feeling whiplash this morning. Whiplash, yeah. indeed. You all go ahead, Doug. I, I, Gloria. Was, I was going to say, Dan and I were talking about this. That that Hillary Clinton, now twice, has sort of been the person who's run for student body president, <laughs> do, has done all her homework, put up all the posters, and these two opponents came in. Uh, who were stars, mm -hmm. celebrities, mm -hmm. and she lost to them. And it's it's it, it's not because you're a woman, but it is it it you know you think of it as the the good girl who's done everything she needed to do, except. Hillary Clinton, and I will say this, made some huge mistakes here that were of her own doing. But in the end, she couldn't overcome her own mistakes, and she got overshadowed by these two candidates, first Obama and then Donald Trump, whom she could just not compete with for different reasons. John McCain just tweeted, congrats to President-elect Donald Trump. As chairman of the Armed Services Committee, I'll work to confront national security challenges and support troops. Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader in the House, just tweeted, the peaceful transfer of power is the cornerstone of our democracy. We have a responsibility to come together. Carl Bernstein, you've written the definitive biography of uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, How is she going to handle this uh, very, very sad moment in her, in her life? Well, as David Gergen just said, she retreats and is so comfortable in her faith. She is a deeply religious person, carries a Bible with her, underlies it, underlines it frequently, uh, believes in the Methodist creed uh, of being called to service, and I think she believes she has done service. Uh, yes, she's made her mistakes, but also her mother's example to her. Her mother, once when Hillary was a little girl and she got knocked down by, by a fellow uh, student at school, her mother said, you got to pick yourself up. And she gave the example of a carpenter's level with a bubble in the middle. And Hillary Clinton has frequently cited that. You pick yourself up, you try to get your level to balance yourself and go forward. Uh, and I think that's what she'll do here. But at the same time, let's not minimize uh, what this terrible upheaval personally means to her, as well as what she feels about the country. Uh, this is someone who believes that Donald Trump was dangerous, that Donald Trump would hurt the country, that he would hurt little girls in terms of their aspirations. That b black people, brown people, those who Hillary Clinton has stood with and for, for all her years uh, in and out of government, she has been a champion of them. And that was the big issue in this campaign for her. So the depth of the disappointment, both personal and political and what it means for the country is, is devastating, but, but indeed religious faith uh, has been, and look what she's been through in her life, through impeachment, uh, through losing the presidency before. Each time she has gone back to her Methodism uh, and the examples of doing more service, I'm not sure we're going to see much uh, public service from her in an open way from here on in, uh, but she also has to find herself in this level place in the example of faith uh, and also she is going to want to see this country succeed under this president. I cannot believe otherwise as difficult as that is for her. Uh, and especially, look, she has been beaten by somebody who called for her to go to jail, and that's not even off the table yet. Uh, I suspect and hope it will be off the table. Uh, but lock her up became the mantra of the Trump campaign. So there's no, there's no overstating how difficult and awful this experience is for her. Yeah, well said. Uh, you know, uh, uh, David Gergen, uh, you worked for her husband, Bill Clinton, when he was president of the United States. And as difficult as this moment is for her, it's also very painful, very difficult for former president Bill Clinton, who was out campaigning 
almost on a daily basis, two, three t uh, appearances a day for his wife. Yes, I, I think Bill Clinton made a real turn in his life a few years ago, and he really committed himself uh, to Hillary and to Chelsea. Uh, and this will be a blow for him, just as it is is going to be for Barack Obama. Oh, you there you see Huma Abedin, uh, one of her closest aides, uh, standing up right now, applauding, and you see her friends there applauding her as well. Uh, no one has been closer on the staff uh, to uh, Hillary Clinton than Huma Abedin. Uh, the uh, estranged wife, uh, or husband is her ex-husband, or estranged husband, uh, Anthony Weiner, the former congressman uh, who we all know uh, generated a lot of commotion. Uh, and now, let's just listen as Tim Kaine, uh, her vice presidential running mate, he goes up on the stage together with his wife, uh, and he's going to say a few words to introduce Hillary Clinton. My wife, Ann, and I are so proud of Hillary Clinton. <clears throat> I'm proud of Hillary Clinton because she has been and is a great history maker in everything she has done as a civil rights lawyer and first lady of Arkansas and first lady of this country and senator and secretary of state. She has made history in a nation that is good at so many things, but that has made it uniquely difficult for a woman to be elected to federal office. She became the first major party nominee as a woman to be president, and last night won the popular vote of Americans to be president. That is an amazing accomplishment. It is an amazing accomplishment. I'm proud of Hillary Clinton because, in the words of Langston Hughes, she's held fast to dreams. She was inspired at a young age to uh, an epiphany that if families and children do well, that's the best barometer for whether a society does well. And in everything she's done, she's focused on that. She, we know she would have made history as a president in one sense, but we never have had a president who's made their whole career about the empowerment of families and children. And I was as excited about that in the Oval Office as I was excited to have my friend Hillary there and make history as the first woman president. I'm excited and proud of Hillary because she has built such a wonderful team. There is a... There... There's a, a, a beautiful and kind of comical parable in the New Testament about a vineyard owner who hires people to work and says, and I'm going to pay you this for a full day. Then he hires people at noon, and I'm going to pay you the same thing for the half day. Then he hires people one hour before, I'm going to pay you the same. And those who started early in the day said, hold on, you know, we, we, we don't like this, that you're treating everybody who came late just as well as you're treating us. I'm going to tell you something. Here's what I've come to know so well about Hillary. The team that she has assembled over the years of people that are so deeply loyal to her because she's so deeply loyal to them is inspiring. But I've seen that same degree of loyalty and compassion and sensitivity extended to the most recent folks who have joined <laughs> the team, the, the folks who came to the vineyard with just one hour to go. Her loyalty and compassion of Hillary and Bill to people, if, if you're with you, you're with you, and th that is just something so remarkable. And finally, I'm proud of Hillary because she loves this country. No, no, nobody, 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 nobody had to wonder about Hillary Clinton whether she would accept an outcome of an election in our beautiful democracy. Nobody had to ask that question. Nobody had to doubt it. She knows our country for what it is. She knows the system that we have and in its warts and blemishes. She's deeply in love with it and accepts it. She's been in battles before where if it didn't go her way, she accepted it, but then woke up the next day and battled again for the dreams that she's held fast to. And that love of country is something that I think is 
is obvious to everybody, obvious to everyone. I want to thank Hillary Clinton for asking Ann and I to join this wild ride. We, um, about a week before, she asked if I would be a running mate. Ann and I went up to Westchester and we sat down with Hillary and Bill and with Chelsea and Mark and with Charlotte and Aiden for about three hours of conversation to try to determine whether we would be the right people to be on the ticket. And when we got in the car to head back to the airport after the three-hour discussion, I said to Ann, honey, I don't know whether we're going to be on this ticket or not, but I do know this. We're going to remember that three hours for the rest, for the rest of our life. And now we've we'll remember 105 days that we've had with this fantastic couple of public servants and all of you for the rest of our life. I'll just say this. Hillary and I know well the wisdom and the words of uh, William Faulkner. He said, they killed us, but they ain't whooped us yet. Um, they killed us. They killed us, but they ain't whooped us yet. Because, because, because we know we know that the work remains. We know that the dreams of empowering families and children remain. And in that work, that important work that we have to do as a nation, it is so comforting, even at a tough time, to know that Hillary Clinton is somebody until her very last breath is going to be battling for the values that make this nation great and the values that we care so deeply about. So now, please join me in welcoming Secretary Hillary Rodney Clinton. so very much for being here. And I love you all, too. Um, last night, I congratulated Donald Trump and offered to work with him on behalf of our country. I hope that he will be a successful president for all Americans. This is not the outcome we wanted or we worked so hard for. And I'm sorry that we did not win this election for the values we share and the vision we hold for our country. But I feel, I feel pride and gratitude for this wonderful campaign that we built together. This vast, diverse, creative, unruly, energized campaign. You represent the best of America, and being your candidate has been one of the greatest honors of my life. I, I know how disappointed you feel because I feel it too. And so do tens of millions of Americans who invested their hopes and dreams in this effort. This is painful, and it will be for a long time. <laughs> But I want you to remember this. Our campaign was never about one person or even one election. It was about the country we love and about building an America that's hopeful, inclusive, and big-hearted. We have seen that our nation is more deeply divided than we thought. But I still believe in America, and I always will. And if you do, 
then we must accept this result and then look to the future. Donald Trump is going to be our president. We owe him an open mind and the chance to lead. Our constitutional democracy enshrines the peaceful transfer of power. And we don't just respect that, we cherish it. It also enshrines other things, the rule of law, the principle that we are all equal in rights and dignity, freedom of worship and expression. We respect and cherish these values too, and we must defend them. And let me add, our constitutional democracy demands our participation, not just every four years, but all the time. So let's do all we can to keep advancing the causes and values we all hold dear, making our economy work for everyone, not just those at the top, protecting our country and protecting our planet, and breaking down all the barriers that hold any American back from achieving their dreams. We've spent a year and a half bringing together millions of people from every corner of our country to say with one voice that we believe that the American dream is big enough for everyone, for people of all races and religions, for men and women, for immigrants, for LGBT people and people with disabilities, for everyone. So now, our responsibility as citizens is to keep doing our part to build that better, stronger, fairer America we seek. And I know you will. I am so grateful to stand with all of you. I want to thank Tim Kaine and Ann Holton for being our partners on this journey. It has been a joy getting to know them better, and it gives me great hope and comfort to know that Tim will remain on the front lines of our democracy, representing Virginia in the Senate. <laughs> to Barack and Michelle Obama, our country owes you an enormous debt of gratitude. Thank you for your graceful, determined leadership that has meant so much to so many Americans and people across the world. And to Bill and Chelsea, Mark, Charlotte, Aiden, our brothers and our entire family, my love for you means more than I can ever express. You crisscrossed this country on our behalf and lifted me up when I needed it most, even four-month-old Aiden, who had traveled with his mom. I will always be grateful to the creative, talented, dedicated men and women at our headquarters in Brooklyn and across our country. your hearts into this campaign. For some of you who are veterans, it was a campaign after you had done other campaigns. Some of you, it was your first campaign. I want each of you to know that you were the best campaign anybody could have ever expected or wanted. And to 
the millions of volunteers, community leaders, activists, and union organizers who knocked on doors, talked to neighbors, posted on Facebook, even in secret private Facebook <laughs> sites. I want everybody coming out from behind that and make sure your voices are heard going forward. <laughs> to everyone who sent in contributions as small as $5 and kept us going, thank you. Thank you from all of us. And to the young people in particular, I hope you will hear this. I have, as Tim said, spent my entire adult life fighting for what I believe in. I've had successes and I've had setbacks, sometimes really painful ones. Many of you are at the beginning of your professional, public, and political careers. You will have successes and setbacks too. This loss hurts, but please never stop believing that fighting for what's right is worth it. keep up these fights now and for the rest of your lives. And to all the women, and especially the young women, who put their faith in this campaign and in me, I want you to know that nothing has made me prouder than to be your champion. still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. And, and to all the little girls who are watching this, never doubt that you are valuable and powerful and deserving of every chance and opportunity in the world to pursue and achieve your own dreams. <laughs> Finally, Finally, I am so grateful for our country and for all it has given to me. I count my blessings every single day that I am an American. And I still believe, as deeply as I ever have, that if we stand together and work together with respect for our differences, strength in our convictions, and love for this nation, our best days are still ahead of us. As you know, you know, I believe we are stronger together and we will go forward together. And you should never, ever regret fighting for that. You know, Scripture tells us, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So my friends, let us have faith in each other. Let us not grow weary. Let us not lose heart. For there are more seasons to come, and there is more work to do. I am incredibly honored and grateful to have had this chance to represent all of you in this consequential election. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America.
was uh, Hillary Clinton. A very, very emotional speech. You saw her holding back, choking back uh, those tears. She uh, is uh, well known as being very, very emotional on these kinds of moments. Clearly a sad moment for her. She congratulated Donald Trump. She said uh, uh, she was also, she said, I know Donald Trump is going to be our president and she totally respects a peaceful transfer of power. And she added this loss hurts, uh, but never stop believing that fight for what's right is worth it. Uh, Gloria, uh, you, you saw Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton deliver a very emotional, powerful speech Clearly, it's not something she wanted to say. Uh, it isn't, and she said it was painful and will be for a long time. And there is a point that Dana and I were discussing along with Rachel Smoke and our DC digital editor, which is she came out at the top of this speech and said, I'm sorry, period. And um, that's what women do. They apologize <laughs> right away and say, I'm sorry. And. Um, People who lose presidential elections often do apologize. I'm not sure they say it at the very top uh, of their speech, which is what Hillary Clinton did today, and feels the pain of all the people who worked for her, with her, who wanted her to become the first woman president, um, and who had been with her for many, many years. And so we all thought it was kind of striking that she came out and said that right out of the box. And it is often at these moments that you see the Hillary Clinton that people yearned to see and that the people closest to her, and you spend time with her, of course, in private, uh, David, uh, working with the Clinton White House, say that is there, that it is somebody who emotes, that it is somebody who is um, empathetic and sympathetic. And that came through in, in spades, saying this is painful and it will be for a long time. She said what she was feeling. and. As we suspected beforehand, not just about herself, but about all the people that she clearly th thinks that she let down, to your point about saying, I I'm sorry. I also thought it was, it was very important that she talked about the peaceful transition of power and that Donald Trump is going to be our president, in, his, in, his wor in her words, and you have to keep an open mind to that. But then not letting go of the fact that she wanted to make clear to her supporters that she's going to try to hold his feet to the fire on some of the things that she ran against him on with regard to how she views he, the way he treats people. You, you, see, you see her, you see her uh, meeting with the staff, their family. Uh, she's going one by one down that uh, aisle over there in the first row. Uh, this is a very, very emotional moment for her. You can see as she, as she confronts all these people who worked tirelessly over these past couple of years to make her the first female president of the United States. And, uh, and now uh, there's a sad moment, a deeply sad moment there. David Gergen, uh, how did you emerge? What did you think of her remarks? I thought it was a remarkably good speech. Uh, it was uh, inspiring, uh, it, but it was also very connective. I, I can't remember a speech that she's given in recent years which seemed to relate so well. To you, She opened up, opened herself up in ways we don't see her, and you could see the pain. It was so apparent the pain she's going through, and you could just imagine how many tears have flowed since last night. I mean, there was, there, I thought all of that worked really well. The other thing was, though, I, even as she was classy and gracious about saying, we're gonna unite behind the president, she made it very clear that the fight goes on. The struggle goes on. We're not she mentioned issues, too. She mentioned issues, but the line that Tim Kaine had from Faulkner, they killed us, but they ain't whooped us yet. That was very much the spirit of her speech. Dave Reston. But also, to, I mean, to talk about, you know, people being equal in, in rights and dignity, talking about uh, the importance of, of immigrants in this country, even people with disabilities. I mean, one of the most searing ads that Hillary Clinton put out there was of, of Donald Trump mocking uh, a reporter with who was disabled. It, it was perfectly uh, pointed, but at the same time, I mean, she got her point across, uh, but at the same time, very gracious and composed. Carl Bernstein, uh, you wrote the biography on Hillary Clinton. Uh, what did you think? I thought it was a remarkable moment in which we saw all that is good about Hillary Clinton. Her principles, 
She has been an imperfect messenger of great and good causes, and she continued to do that in that speech. Uh, she also laid down a set of principles for her adherence, for people in the Democratic Party, as well as those who believe in the same things that she does uh, to follow. And I suspect that we're going to hear and see something of the same from President Obama today, because I think some of this speech was also directed at the new president-elect, that Obama also will do something along these lines of saying, these are universal principles about freedom, about the dignity of individuals uh, that you must respect as president of the United States and protect. And one last point here is the purple that was worn by both her and former President Bill Clinton. I couldn't help but notice it. Uh, it's the color of spirituality. It's the color of mourning. It's the color of mystery. I, I can't believe it was an accident that both Hillary Clinton and former President Bill Clinton were wearing purple in this remarkable moment that was a tableau of the Clintons and the best of what they stand for. There, and she's and there you see her right uh, hugging uh, and kissing so many of her supporters there uh, right at her side as has been the case for maybe 20 years. You see her in the middle of the screen Huma Abedin her longtime aide uh, one of her closest aides she's called Huma Abedin almost like a second daughter to her uh, Huma Abedin of course in the last few days of this campaign uh, all of a sudden uh, we learned uh, that uh, her estranged husband was under an FBI investigation for sexting with a 15-year-old girl and emails uh, that were discovered on their shared computer.